Hi everyone, welcome to our series Before Spirit was Spiritualistic, Philosophical Materialism from Genesis to Jesus. This is the first talk of the series, and it will actually have two main parts. In the first section, I'll be introducing the basic ideas that we'll be talking about throughout the whole series. And then in the second section, we'll go through a history of Christian materialism, starting from today and then going back in time. So first, materialism, what is that? Well, at first you might think, is that a preoccupation with wealth? Are we talking about consumerism? Answer, no, we're not actually talking about any of those things. Philosophical materialism is actually a belief about the nature of reality. It's the idea that everything that exists is purely material. To state it in another way, it's the idea that nothing non-physical exists. So throughout this series, we will actually be sharing with you information that shows that there was in ancient Israel a line of, of thinking or thinkers, a school of thought that was philosophically materialist and that Jesus, among others, was actually part of that school of thought. But before we get into that, I would like you to consider this. This picture of Jesus was owned by a woman in France, and she had it hanging in her kitchen above her hot plate uh, every day, you know, day after day saw it and didn't really think anything of it until in 2019, she decided to move. And so she had a local auctioneer come and evaluate her possessions to see if there was anything worth selling. And they looked into this item further, and it turned out that it's actually a lost painting of the 13th century Italian painter Cimabue. And later that year, 2019, she sold it for 24 million euros. So quite the remarkable circumstance. And uh, it actually has a lesson for us. It has uh, it can serve as an illustration for something that is quite relevant to our series. So here you had this woman, she saw this picture every day, but she didn't really see it for what it is. She didn't realize that there is this incredible backstory behind it, that it was so much more than an ordinary painting, that it was unexpected and interesting and of greater value than she could have possibly imagined. So for all of us, that parallels pictures of Jesus that we are regularly accustomed to, that we see all the time, particularly the pictures of Jesus in the New Testament Gospels, for example. We're used to seeing them in a certain way, but I want you to all ask the question, is it possible that we're not really seeing them for what they are? We're not seeing this picture of Jesus for what it really is. Consider that possibility. And actually, in this series, we will be making the case that what you have before you, these pictures that seem so familiar, are actually far more interesting and far more valuable than you would have ever guessed. But in order to gain that benefit, we have to consider and keep in mind certain principles of learning. The sorts of things I'm talking about are like this. Be willing to learn and unlearn. One way of thinking about this is just that you have to be willing to consider the possibility that you haven't quite yet seen the picture as it really is. So we can exchange one set of ideas for another if we learn that, in fact, it is the case that there is more to the picture than we realized. Another important principle is conscientiously consider evidence. There are two real aspects to this. First, we should consider evidence as opposed to consulting, for example, our feelings or tradition or any number of other things. We should really consider the evidence and base our positions on that. And the second aspect is that we should do so very thoroughly and very carefully. We should be responsible in how we consider the evidence rather than doing so in a haphazard or even lazy kind of way. And lastly, it's always important to self-examine for biases. Cherished ideas can really skew how we interpret new evidence. We might want to kind of bend things to maintain the view that we already have, especially if we really like that view. Um, and that's just something we all need to be aware of so that we can keep it in check. None of us can 
totally skate escape biases altogether. But again, we can really be thoughtful about it and try to prevent biases from determining the outcomes of our investigation. And one really important way to do that is to make sure that you're grounded on the things, the, the principles that really will lead you to truth. So if you don't think about it too carefully, you might automatically kind of end up siding with your political tribe, your religious tribe. Um, that's There's just an enormous, an enormous social pressure for all of us to maintain the views of those that we are a, a part of in terms of group identity. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, takes a little bit more effort to even be willing to consider a position that isn't popular among those with whom we identify. But if we decide that rather than being primarily a, you know, fill in the blank, whatever the identity is, that instead primarily we are a seeker of truth and a follower of truth, if that is our primary identity, then our identities shouldn't get in the way of us actually discovering and learning truth. So please keep all these sorts of principles in mind. Now, we need to define certain key terms that are relevant for this whole series. I've used the term materialism already, and it turns out there are two other terms that are very closely associated with materialism. We have physicalism and corporealism. All these terms are roughly equivalent, despite different etymologies and various nuances in their difference. What they mean is the belief that everything is material, or the belief that nothing non-physical exists. That's what materialism is. That's what physicalism is. That's what corporealism is. But in order to understand this better, we need to go into it in a little bit more detail, and we want to do so by considering what materialism does not imply. This is kind of addressing certain common misconceptions about materialism. So first, materialism does not imply that the only things that exist are what we can sense with our senses. And this is actually really easy to understand when you realize that materialism is a claim about the nature of reality, not about our ability to sense that reality. So our senses could be severely limited, and yet that does not in any way conflict with the actual claims of philosophical materialism. Next, materialism does not imply that solidity is essential to matter. This is kind of just a surface impression that sometimes people have that, oh, you know, matter, that's like, you know, real solid stuff, right? Well, you know, a little thought, I think it becomes evident that you know, uh, solidity isn't the only state of matter. There's also liquid and gas and plasma, and they are no less material than solid objects. There's nothing about materialism that favors solidity over other states of matter. But you might think, well, wait a second, on a deeper level though, if you take anything, whether it's a gas or liquid, plasma, solid, and you break it down into little bits, if materialism's true, doesn't it, uh, like, ultimately boil down to these little, hard, solid bits of matter. That theory, by the way, is called atomism. The idea of an atom in ancient Greek philosophy was an indivisible little bit of solid matter. Can't break it down any further. So as you might know, that's quite different from the modern idea of atoms. What we call atoms today in modern science actually do have parts and they can be split. They're made up of smaller subatomic particles. So does materialism imply atomism? Well, the answer to that is actually no. And several key thinkers in the history of materialism have actually argued against atomism and instead argued that uh, matter at its finest scale, or rather there is no finest scale, that it's liquid all the way down and it's infinitely divisible. And that actual solidity is not a fundamental property of matter. So one more major misconception here, one thing that materialism does not imply, the idea that 
all nouns that describe realities must describe objects. Okay, so no one who has this, misconcep uh, this misconception that I'm aware of puts it quite like this. Nevertheless, it captures a real common misconception. People tend to think that if you can name something that is not a material object, that it must be something that materialism has a hard time accounting for, something that conflicts with materialism in some way. So people might mention love or justice or numbers like the number three. You know, you can't grab the number three. You can't grab love and measure it and it's not a material object. So is that uh, in any way in conflict with, with materialism? Does materialism imply that anything we can name must be a material object? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, there's nothing about materialism that implies that everything must be a material object. And if you think about it, just because something is not a material object doesn't mean that it must therefore be an immaterial object. The other option is that it's simply not an object at all. And that's how materialism approaches things like love and justice and numbers, they aren't objects at all. To give another example of this sort of thing, or even several examples, think about something like migration. Is migration an object? Can you grab it? Can you measure it? Can you touch it? <laughs> you know, this is how people describe uh, this sort of experience of determining whether something is an object, right? Well, no, migration isn't any of those things. Does that mean that it is an immaterial object? No. In fact, migration isn't an object at all. It is a process, and a material one at that. Same with decay. Same with condensation. There are many, many examples that could be given, but the idea is that these words that we're using, migration, decay, condensation, these words do not point to objects in the world. They point to processes, and these processes happen to be material processes. There's not some immaterial thing that is decay. No, it's it's just a process. So materialism uh, considers words to refer to many different things. Some words refer to objects. Some words refer to processes. Some words refer to relationships between objects or objects and processes. And some words summarize a huge number of things that are combinations of objects, processes, relationships, so on. So love, for example, what is that? Well, the word love is actually pointing to a whole array of different things that have to do with relationships between people, how people act toward one another, how people feel toward one another. All of that is captured in the word love. And different languages capture different aspects of reality in different ways. But the, the central claim of materialism is that no matter what, no matter how your words relate to reality, the reality to which they relate is totally material. Okay, so hopefully that clarifies what materialism does not imply. To understand it a little further, let's now look at what it does imply. And in order to do this, we're going to understand a little bit about the nature of matter. So first and most importantly, materialism does imply that everything has extension. That is, everything has body. That's what corporeal means, by the way, body. So extension, it's a term that refers to anything that has length and width and height. Those are the properties of extension. So everything has extension. Now, building on that, everything has location. Everything has place. And the reason for this is pretty simple. It flows from the fact that everything has extension. Extension means to occupy space, and the space which a thing occupies is its place. It's its location. So you see how one point of materialism kind of flows from the next. The next major point is that materialism does imply that everything has internal structure. Now, for something to have extension, kind of implies this, right? Like there must be some structure internally of something or an internal structure to something in order for it to maintain that structure. 
So it has internal structure. It has some sort of shape. And in order for it to have internal structure, it means that it must be composed of parts. And if it has parts, that implies that it has divisibility because those parts, at least theoretically, could be separated. And this leads us to the next point because that which has parts and has divisibility has the potential for those parts to be arranged in relationship to each other in a different way. And for it, that to happen, for there to be a difference in, in a arrangement implies motion. So everything is subject to motion. Another way to put this is that everything is subject to change. Everything is subject to time. Time is the sequence of change. So this right here is really important. What's on the screen before you right now, this is the core claim of materialism. It's saying that everything has these properties. All reality, it has extension, location, internal structure, parts, divisibility. Everything is subject to motion, change, and time. There's nothing that escapes these attributes. Okay, so that hopefully makes it really clear of what materialism is. But now we need to consider the terms on kind of the opposite side of the question. Immaterialism, spiritualism, and incorporealism. These three terms, like the three with materialism, all mean roughly the same thing. Yes, there are differences in nuance, differences in the history of the words, but at least these days, they are used to mean roughly the same thing. And you'll notice that immaterialism is actually just the direct negation of materialism, not materialism. <laughs> Incorporealism is the direct negation of corporealism, not corporealism. Spiritualism is kind of the odd one out, right? But in this context, spiritualism just means non-physical. This use of the term spiritualism, by the way, isn't the more narrow usage. Uh, sometimes people use the term modern spiritualism, uh, and that refers to a movement uh, that started in the 1800s that was focused on uh, trying to contact the dead. Sometimes it's also called spiritism. Um, but spiritualism in this context is a philosophical term that means belief in spirit, and spirit, again in this context, means non-physical. So spiritualism is just another term for belief in non-physicality. Now, is spiritualism, incorporealism, immaterialism, does this constitute the belief that everything is non-physical? The answer is no. It simply means non-physical stuff exists. Some people who subscribe to immaterialism, again, whether they use the label or not, do believe that everything is non-physical. But actually, the vast majority of incorporealists, immaterialists, are dualists. That is, they believe that the fundamental nature of reality has two basic substances, or there are two real types of stuff in the world. There's the physical and the non-physical. That position is called substance dualism. But that is a form of immaterialism, because again, it's not materialism. Materialism is really the, the, the position that everything is matter. Everything is material. Immaterialism is just the position that not everything is material. Some non-physical stuff at least exists. Now, it's really, too important, it's really important to understand what this means. And in order to do this, we're going to look at some examples of various uh, incorporealists, individuals who believe in the existence of non-physical stuff and see how they describe this. But just notice that it's the negation of materialism. It is the belief in the existence of some stuff that doesn't participate in the qualities of matter, but rather has uh, qualities that are not that. <laughs> so it's actually, it's an entirely negative claim in a sense, because it's saying that there's something that exists, and what is that something? Well, we can't really describe what it is, but it's not material. In other words, it's not extended. It's not local. It doesn't have structure. It doesn't have parts. It's not divisible. 
It's not subject to movement or change. It's not within time. All of these are the, uh, the negative qualities of immateriality, non-physicality, incorporeality. So let's look at some examples of people who promote this idea and see how they put it. This is Charles Wesley. Uh, he was a famous hymn writer in the 18th century. And here's a line from what was, at least at one time, a popular hymn. Beyond the bounds of time and space, look forward to that happy place, the saint's secure abode. So notice that he's, he's saying that Christians should look forward to a state of existence that is beyond the bounds of time and space. Beyond the bounds of time and space means that whatever that existence is, isn't an existence that is within time and space. In other words, there's no time and no space in this state of existence. And just imagine with me for a moment what that is supposed to be like. What is that state of existence? Well, in that state of existence, there is no here or there, right? Because there's no space. There's no locality. There's no extension. No here or there. There's no such thing as distant or close. No such thing as parallel or perpendicular, in front or behind, beside or between. None of these concepts have any meaning in immateriality. Also, no now and then, because this is beyond the bounds of time. No now and then, no past and future, no present, no fast or slow, no succession of moments at all. That's the idea of beyond the bounds of time and space. Now, you might be like, oh, what is that idea exactly? It is incomprehensible, right? We have nothing that we can relate to anything like that. No moments, no succession of moments. What's happening? Well, anyway, this is uh, one of these interesting aspects of trying to wrap our minds around this uh, discussion, but the best that we can do is to look at what these people say and understand the actual claims of immateriality, and like we did with materialism. So Charles Wesley gave voice to this idea. He certainly wasn't the first. Uh, and let's actually next consider someone who uh, is far more famous and influential, Augustine of Hippo. Uh, here is a letter written uh, near the beginning of the fifth century. And he's talking about God. He says, the eyes of this body do not see God and will not see him. As a matter of fact, I added the reason why I said this, namely to prevent the belief that God is himself corporeal or visible in any locality or space relation. Okay. So he's trying to prevent the belief that God is corporeal, that God has body. So again, he's, he's thinking God has no body, no shape, no size. He continues. Therefore, I do not regret having said this because we should not have such an irreverent idea of God as to imagine that instead of being everywhere wholly present, he can be distributed through portions of space. What does that mean exactly? Well, actually, we'll go on to the next slide, and I think that it'll make uh, even more sense. Now, he's actually talking about God here. He says, incorporeal substance. This is a description of the substance of God. Incorporeal substance without space relations, neither distributed through portions of space, nor limited by bodily features and dimensions, but everywhere wholly present. Okay, so Augustine's notion of the uh, omnipresence of God is not that God is distributed through space. No, that would actually ascribe to God extension, right? Length, width, height. God can't have those things because that would mean that God is corporeal. So God is an incorporeal substance in Augustine's view, and he's not extended through space. No, rather, God is everywhere wholly present. In other words, God is wholly here and God is wholly here. Well, how does that make sense? It's kind of incomprehensible, right? Because just for anyone to say at any moment 
that something is holy here, holy here, right? Not just here, but holy here, entirely here. It must not be here. That seems like a, a very straightforward, logical inference. But Augustine is saying, no, no, God is holy here and holy here, not extended throughout space. This is an incomprehensible notion and professedly so. Christian doctrine holds it to be incomprehensible. It is actually supposed to be kind of contrary to human reason, and that's part of the mystery of divinity in this understanding. But let's just have that in mind, like incorporeality, that's what it is. It is the negation of all material aspects, all material properties. It's not extended, not uh, having any sort of location, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the idea of immateriality. But you might be thinking, well, wait a second. Seems like some people, at least, believe that there can be immaterial things that are located in some particular place, like a ghost haunting a house or what have you. Well, interestingly, uh, Socrates actually talked about this and explained how you could square that circle. Well, I said Socrates. It may be Socrates, but also maybe Plato. Uh, we, what I'm going to quote to you is actually from the writings of Plato, and he is uh, quoting Socrates, and historians debate whether or to what degree this represents Socrates' actual views, or if Plato is putting his own views into the mouth of Socrates. But regardless, we're considering what at least one of these Greek philosophers had to say about, well, we're about to see. <laughs> this is uh, Plato's Phaedo, and the context here is that Socrates is about to die, and he's having his last conversation with his disciples. And the main point of his dialogue in the Phaedo is to argue for the immortality of the soul. So here's some of what Socrates or Plato has to say. The soul, though invisible, which departs, or sorry, the soul, the invisible, which departs into another place, which is like itself noble and pure and invisible to the realm of the gods and the other world in truth, to the good and wise God, whither if God will, my soul is soon to go. If it departs pure, dragging with it nothing of the body, because it never willingly associated with the body and life, but avoided it and gathered itself into itself alone, since this has always been its constant study. But this means nothing else than that it pursued philosophy rightly, and really practiced being in a state of death. Or is not this the practice of death? Okay, so what's happening here? He's talking about the soul and how if a soul is pure, when the person dies, the soul departs to the realm of the gods, dragging with it nothing of the body. But this is, again, what happens to a soul that is pure, one that has lived in the body without ever willingly associating with it. So it lives separate from the body. It lives by means of this uh, pure practice of philosophy, according to Socrates or Plato's view, it is separating itself from the body constantly, and that is a state of death. And actually, earlier in the Phaedo, uh, Socrates explained that that is exactly what death is in his view. We believe, do we not, that death is the separation of the soul from the body, and that the state of being dead is the state in which the body is separated from the soul and exists alone by itself, and the soul is separated from the body and exists alone by itself. Is death anything other than this? Okay, so clearly, in his view, death is the separation of the soul and the body, and that these are two independently existing things. So human nature, in this view, is dualistic. There's two aspects. There's the, the body and the soul, and the soul is something that can depart to an invisible world and... Uh, live on forever, potentially, but only if <laughs> one is practiced in true philosophy, according to this. But what about people who, when they die, 
don't have that pure separation of body and soul. Well, this is what Socrates or Plato says. But I think if when it departs from the body, it is defiled and impure because it was always with the body and cared for it and loved it and was fascinated by it and its desires and pleasures so that it thought nothing was true except the corporeal. Do you think such a soul or do you think a soul in this condition will depart pure and uncontaminated? By no means, said he, but it will be interpenetrated, I suppose, with the corporeal, which intercourse and communion with the body have made a part of its nature, because the body has been its constant companion and the object of its care. Certainly, says the student. And my friend, we must believe that the corporeal is burdensome and heavy and earthly and visible. And such a soul is weighed down by this and is dragged back into the visible world. And so, as they say, it flits about the monuments and the tombs where, shapey, where shadowy shapes of souls have been seen. Figures of those souls, which were not set free in purity, but retain something of the visible. And this is why they are seen. Okay, so what's happening here? What Socrates or Plato is describing is that people who didn't actually regard the body as totally separate from their own selves, their soul, those people loved the flesh and kind of their, their soul and their body became interpenetrated, became combined together in some way so that when they die, the, the soul kind of leaves the body, but it retains some bodily aspects with it. And so it's visible. But notice that being visible, being able to be in a location in one place or another, these are not proper attributes of soul stuff. These are attributes of a soul that is still retaining some of the attributes of corporeality by being contaminated with it. So that's one explanation by an incorporealist as to how sometimes you can have immaterial things that are partaking of certain attributes of corporeality. It's not that they are actually having, like the actual immaterial stuff isn't actually corporeal at all. It doesn't have actual location, et cetera, et cetera. It's just kind of becoming contaminated with corporeality. This view, by the way, isn't just something to be found with the philosophers such as Plato and Socrates. It actually goes back earlier into like the 8th century BC in uh, Greek thinking. So, for example, you have in uh, Homer's Odyssey, the famous scene where Odysseus travels to Hades and he meets the ghost of his mother and he tries to embrace her, but she just like escaped his embrace. And he's like, mother, why do you not stay still when I would embrace you? And her response is, my son, she answered, all people are like this when they are dead. The sinews no longer hold the flesh and bones together. These perish in the fierceness of consuming fire as soon as life has left the body and the soul flits away as though it were a dream. Okay, so here uh, Odysseus's mother is like the person that Plato described where they're kind of still, you know, bodily. They can kind of be seen. He could identify her, but they're not really bodily. It's because well, this person evidently didn't have pure philosophy and was able to completely separate their soul from their from anything corporeal. And uh, I should also mention that in where we left off from Socrates, what he goes on to describe next is that those souls that kind of hang around in the corporeal world eventually become re-embodied in something else suited to how they lived their previous life. That is how they mentally lived their previous life. So he, he says that, you know, a person might become a donkey or whatever. So it's the transmigration of the souls. Souls are pre-existent and then they go from body to body until hopefully one day they are in, in a person who has true philosophy and then escapes the material world altogether. So here we have it. Our key terms, materialism, physicalism, corporealism, all the same. It means everything is material. Nothing non-physical exists.
Then on the flip side, we have immaterialism, which is the same as spiritualism and incorporealism. It's the idea that non-physical stuff does exist, whether matter exists as well or not. Now, you may have noticed that not all of these terms, in fact, most of these terms did not show up in what we just read from people, whether Charles Wesley or Augustine or Socrates or Homer. Yet, they were clearly able to indicate that the view that they espoused was what we would call immaterialism, incorporealism. I make this point because throughout this series, we're going to be looking at ancient texts that don't necessarily use these terms. Most of these terms are modern. But we will be able to tell whether someone is promoting incorporealism or corporealism. And there are certain ways that we can make that identification. It's important to approach it without kind of like dictating ahead of time what criteria someone has to meet or a certain text has to meet. But by understanding materialism and immaterialism, we can pick up on what is being said. Now, all that said, I want to mention a few basic things that are like core beliefs of materialism on one hand and immaterialism on the other. So there's immaterialistic core beliefs and materialistic core beliefs. As I've said a few times, materialism has to be entire, right? It has to disallow any immaterial existence. Immaterialism, on the other hand, can easily allow for material existence. What this means is that immaterialism has certain aspects of it that might be even uh, easier to identify, or I'll just say that the nature of immateriality kind of narrows down what it is that we can look at in order to easily determine, or a, an area in which we'll be most likely able to determine whether a certain author is materialistic or immaterialistic in their thinking. The reason for this is that immaterialists tend to, by and large, have at least a, a couple things that they almost universally view as being immaterial. And those two things are human consciousness and God. Some might say, oh, yes, human consciousness is immaterial, and they might not be theistic. They might not believe in God at all, so they don't have an immaterial God. Or someone might believe in an immaterial God and yet regard human nature as being totally material. But if someone's an immaterialist, I don't know of any example where someone's an immaterialist and doesn't have at least one or the other, right? Like these are the two most common things. And most often an immaterialist will regard both God and human consciousness as being immaterial. And even like we read from the Phaedo, Socrates or Plato, whichever one it is, actually regarded the human soul as departing to a realm that is like itself the realm of the gods. So there are these non-bodily entities that include souls and deities in this view. Okay, so we have these two common things, human consciousness and God, but let's break it down a little bit further. So on the immaterialistic side, one of the core and very common beliefs is that our thinking part is separate from the body. On the other hand, materialism affirms that our thinking part is part of the body. I should just mention as a side note that in the modern world, we understand that our thinking part is the brain. That's actually surprisingly recent, at least in terms of being established. People have speculated about which part of our body does the thinking for a long time. But even in the 17th century, uh, there were major thinkers who were still thinking that the heart was essential in imagination, in uh, visualizing things in our mind, as it were, uh, responsible for some cognitive functions, in other words. So, yeah, in the ancient world, we'll see uh, some people like ancient Hebrews, for example, weren't aware of the function of the brain at all. Um, and so one ancient belief was that the heart is responsible for some of cognition or some other body parts as well. So in any case, though, the materialistic perspective is that our thinking part is part of the body. Next, immaterialism suggests that our self, our true self, our true I, who is it that is me? Who is it that is you? Our self survives death. 
this is a very, very common core belief of immaterialistic thinking. Materialistic thinking, on the other hand, says that our self is our body, and it is what dies. So it doesn't survive death. Next, an immaterialistic core belief is that God is beyond space and time. Perhaps surprisingly, one of these core materialistic beliefs for materialists who believe in God is that God is corporeal or bodily and time bound. There's a lot more that could be said on this and throughout our series, we will say a whole lot more about all of these various aspects. But these are things to keep in mind when we're looking at various ancient writings. We're gonna look at Israelite writings, we're gonna look at writings from the early Jesus movement and see how they handle these issues. If you have a writing and you wanna know, did, this, did the author of this text view things materialistically or immaterialistically? These are kind of the best places to go to to answer that question as simply and straightforwardly as you can. What does it say about the thinking part of humans? What does it say about death and whether the self survives it? What does it say about God? Does it describe God as corporeal or as incorporeal? In the bounds of time and space or beyond the bounds of time and space? If you find a text that says any of these things on the left, that the thinking part is separate from the body, or again, any of them, then you know that the author is was an immaterialist. They believed in the existence of non-physical stuff. On the other hand, if you have a text that doesn't give any hint of immaterialistic ideas in any regard, and it even has materialistic views of the thinking part of human, humankind, and materialistic ideas of the self and death, and materialistic ideas of even God being corporeal and within time and space, well then, yeah, that author was a materialist. So there's something now very important that we need to consider. We've been talking about how we're gonna look at various ancient texts. So it's time we talk about this. The Bible is the window that most people have to view the world of Jesus and the world of ancient Israel. But there are a few really important things that we need to know. First, and this might seem kind of obvious, but this is a collection, a library, an anthology of originally separate writings by different authors at different times. Might sound like a simple point. It's really important and it'll be manifest why more so as we go. The second main point is that this particular collection, and I'm imagining that this image here of this Bible is a 66 book Protestant Bible. This particular collection is relatively recent. It's relatively modern. In fact, the first time that we have on record, at least as far as I was able to find, where this particular collection is mentioned goes back to this guy, <laughs> James Usher. Uh, he's most famous for calculating that creation took place in the year 4004 BC. But before he made that calculation, he actually wrote something else that is perhaps even more significant and important. It's the Irish Articles of Religion written by James Usher in 1615. This is the first document that has a list of what should comprise the Bible that exactly matches the modern Protestant 66 book biblical canon. Uh, there are other lists prior to this that come so close, like there's one in 1559 by John Calvin in the French Confession of Faith that on the surface looks like it's the same list, but a little more investigation reveals that uh, it actually includes, John Calvin's Bible includes uh, a book called The Prayer of Manasseh that isn't in the Protestant Bible. Uh, it includes it along with Second Chronicles. So it's still not quite an exact match. The first time that you have an exact match is 1615. Now think about how far away this is from the world of Jesus, right? Like this is a long time after Jesus and the first uh, disciples. That's the first time we have someone mentioned, ah, the Bible should be these 66 books exactly. 
Well, what about the Catholic Bible? The Catholic Bible is very similar, 73 books, a little bit more than the Protestant Bible. Uh, we have to go to this guy, John Paul III, in 1546 to have the Catholic Bible finalized, to have it established as what it is today, the 73 books that Catholics have. The main point is that this, no matter how you slice it, whether you're looking at the Protestant Bible, the Catholic Bible, or the Bibles of other uh, major uh, sections of Christianity, like the Greek Orthodox Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, um, they all have different Bibles that are largely overlapping and yet not entirely overlapping collections. But no matter which one you're talking about, these are modern collections. So when we use this to understand the ancient world, when we're wanting to look at Jesus and his disciples and ancient Israelites and the various prophets and so forth, we need to keep in mind, this is a modern collection. And when I'm reading these writings, if I wanna understand the ancient world, I can't read it as a book. I can't read it as this one entity that is the Bible. I need to look at each individual writing on its own. And it's also important to realize that this is just a small sample of the actual ancient writings that existed in ancient Israel. So I'll give you a couple examples of other writings that existed in ancient Israel and that we now know and have. This, for example, is a scroll of Psalms found uh, at Qumran in the, uh, near the Dead Sea in Israel. So this is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this Psalm scroll contains some Psalms that were later compiled as part of the Psalm book that is in Bibles today. But it also contains Psalms that weren't included, that were not preserved, and that were lost until they were discovered again in the 1940s and 50s. There's also other texts like this, the angelic liturgy. Uh, thankfully, this isn't the only fragment of it because we wouldn't be able to read very much of it then. But this is a text that was totally unknown until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And yet it is a text from ancient Judaism that predates the time of Jesus. And it, if we want to understand these ancient people and their views, we should include texts like this in our investigation as well. Also, the Odes of Solomon, the, these are a collection of 42 poems written by an early follower of Jesus, though not included in the New Testament. So these are just a tiny little a sample of other writings that are kind of beyond the Bible, as it were, but it's really important to consider these. Now, I should also mention that we have several modern collections, like on the right, James Charlesworth's Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, and at the top there we have the Apocryphal New Testament. This one is by J.K. Eliot. These are just a couple examples, but there are uh, modern collections put together by scholars to uh, give English translations of many of these ancient texts that were not included in the Bible, whether Protestant, Catholic, or otherwise. So we in this series will quote sometimes from texts that are in the Bible. But when we do, don't think of it as the Bible. Think of it as an ancient text. We will also be quoting from other writings that were not included in the later biblical collections. Now, as we do this, I just want to mention that our claim is not that all of these texts have materialistic views. In fact, some of them do not. Some of them have immaterialistic views. Nor are we claiming that the vast majority of ancient Israelites were materialists. In fact, before the Babylonian exile in 586 BC, it, you get the impression in reading some of these ancient texts that uh, the worship of idols or idolatry was quite widespread in ancient Israel. And that idea of idolatry implies some sort of immaterialistic belief because you have some aspect or essence of a deity that is presumably not bodily until it finds its body in the idol. So it becomes embodied and it can be disembodied. So that's kind of an immaterialistic belief, right? So not all ancient Israelites were materialists. Not all ancient Israelite texts promote materialism. 
some actually promote immaterialism. Um, but materialistic views are more prevalent and predominant in these writings than you would expect. And that's what we're going to be sharing. We're going to show how Jesus and his disciples were part of that materialist school in ancient Israel. But we can't just dive into these texts just yet. First, we need to consider Christian corporealism. It's often assumed that corporealism or materialism must be incompatible with Christianity and with religion as a whole. But what we're about to see is that that certainly is not the case. In fact, Christian materialism or Christian corporealism is a thing and has been for a long time. Uh, there are a few things I want you to take away from this. First of all, it's just that point that there is a such thing as Christian corporealism, Christian materialism. Uh, secondly, I want you to see that the way that we are going to be presenting various ancient texts throughout the rest of this series is uh, not some brand new way. In other words, the way that we are understanding these texts as actually containing materialistic views, as promoting corporealism, is not something brand new. You know, there have been students of these texts for hundreds of years who have read them and concluded that they do indeed teach corporealistic views. So uh, we will go through this history and look at some examples of various writers uh, who were Christian corporealists. And if we had a whole lot of time, I could go through and give a lot more information about how they had materialist, uh, materialistic views and materialistic understandings of these ancient texts in regard to a whole host of things, right? Human nature, the nature of death, the nature of God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we're only going to have time here to go through enough to show you that, aha, yes, these people were indeed Christians and they were indeed corporealists. So let's get into it. The largest corporealist Christian movement in recent history was actually the first generation of the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church is no longer corporealistic or materialistic today. But the first generation was the materiality of all things was a recurring theme throughout their writings, and they wrote quite plainly about it. Uh, we'll just give you a few examples so you can see the sort of thing I'm talking about. And the first will be from someone who you are doubtless familiar with. This is John Harvey Kellogg. Even if you don't recognize his face, you surely recognize his cereal. Uh, he and his brother came up with cornflakes and uh, wheat flakes, you know, flaked cereal overall. This is an ad in Kellogg's magazine, Good Health from 1902. And uh, interestingly, at this very time, he was busy promoting spiritualistic theories within Seventh-day Adventism because Kellogg had a change of views. Earlier, as we're about to see, he had the materialistic views of the rest of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. But he later changed his views and was influential in shifting perspectives within the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, that resulted in the current state of belief within Seventh-day Adventism, which is dualistic uh, rather than materialistic. So this is the younger John Harvey Kellogg in 1879. In that year, he published a book called The Soul and the Resurrection. And on page 36, he says this, The basis of existence. All existences have a material basis. In other words, matter is the basis of all existence. All existing things are either material in character or are the attributes or characteristics of some material thing. Such a thing as an immaterial substance is a non-entity, an impossibility. So it's hard to imagine a clearer statement of philosophical materialism. And notice this guy is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. There's no question that this uh, he's not an, an atheist or a deist or an unbeliever, he is a Christian, and yet he's plainly a materialist or a 
corporealist. And this is simply how the early Seventh-day Adventist movement was. Here's another example. This is Dudley Canwright. He was one of the leading authors and preachers of the Seventh-day Adventist movement in the first generation. And in his book, The Ministration of Angels, he argues for the materiality of angels. You know, people often think that angels are the, the spirits of the deceased, or even if they're not the spirits of the deceased, they are some sort of immaterial, incorporeal beings. He argued that that is not in fact the case according to scripture. And in doing so, he also commented more broadly on things related to materialism and immateriality. He said, how can an immaterial thing exist? Man knows nothing about it, for he has never seen, heard, smelled, touched, or tasted it. Philosophy knows nothing about it. Science is silent concerning it. Reason cannot comprehend it and the Bible has not mentioned it. In conclusion, immateriality is only another name for non-entity. You'll find throughout the writings of Christian materialists that they express materialism both positively, as in just stating in the affirmative, everything is matter, everything is material, or the same doctrine, materialism, stated negatively. That is, nothing is immaterial. Or another way to say that is immateriality is nothingness. It's non-entity. Again, to deny immateriality, non-matter, any existence, is to affirm that everything is material. Let's look at another statement from the same author. This is actually from a series of articles called The Personality of God, uh, published in the Review and Herald in 1878. And this, this idea, the personality of God, is actually one of the pillar doctrines of early Seventh-day Adventism. And it's the idea that God is a material, corporeal being with body and parts, uh, a being in whose image or in whose shape humans were made. This is one of their uh, major doctrines, the early Seventh-day Adventists. And what's interesting about this particular series of articles is that Canwright had the direct help of two other early Seventh-day Adventists, that's Ellen and James White. Uh, they were two of the main founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and Ellen White is regarded by Seventh-day Adventists as being a messenger from God. So this is what it says in this article. We utterly deny the distinction between matter and spirit which is claimed. We believe that all things are material, although matter may manifest itself in a great diversity of forms. The idea of the diversity of forms of matter is something that Christian materialists have often talked about to say, look, when you uh, consider the diversity of matter, everything that needs to be accounted for, every phenomenon, everything that we experience, everything that we know about can be accounted for by the diversity of matter. We don't need to invoke some immaterial thing. Anyway, a very plain affirmative statement of materialism. Now, Seventh-day Adventists actually emerged from Adventists in the 1840s. Uh, the Adventists are also known as Millerites, and they were not a materialist movement, but there was at least one materialist among them. This is George Storrs, and in 1842, he published six sermons on the inquiry, Is there immortality in sin and suffering? And consider what he says. It is said, the soul is a simple essence, immaterial, uncompounded, indivisible, indestructible, and hence immortal. I got to pause there just to comment. Immaterial, uncompounded, indivisible, etc. The idea here is that the immortality of the soul is based on the immateriality of the soul. So if something is immaterial, it's not composed of parts, right? Remember how we talked about the fact that materiality is composed of parts. Anything that's material is composed of parts. And uh, 
if it's composed of parts, it's subject to change. Well, if something's immaterial, it has no parts, it can't be destroyed. It can't, is not subject to change. And hence, it's immortal. It's going to last forever, right? So that's the idea. So the soul is supposed to be immaterial and thus immortal. But George Storrs asks, what is immateriality? Strictly speaking, it is not material, not matter. In other words, it is not substance. And what is that which has no substance? What kind of creation is it? If the creator formed all things out of nothing, it would seem that man's soul has taken the form of its original and is nothing still, for it is not matter, we are told. So again, George Storrs is saying that if something is not matter, it is nothing. So immateriality is nothing to him. This is stating uh, materialism in the negative, right? Continuing on, he says, if it is said it is a spiritual substance, I ask, what kind of substance is that if it is not matter? I cannot conceive, and I do not see how it is possible to conceive, of substance without matter in some form. It may be exceedingly refined. I regard the phrase immaterial as one which properly belongs to the things which are not a sound without sense or meaning, a mere cloak to hide the nakedness of the theory of an immortal soul in man, a phrase of which its authors are as profoundly ignorant as the most unlearned of their pupils. Okay, so he's clearly rejecting immateriality, and he's pointing out that it is an inconceivable idea to actually think of something existing that has no location, that has no extension, that has no parts, no whatever, no shape. You know, how do you conceive of that? You can't. So he's saying that the authors of this phrase are as profoundly ignorant of it as the most unlearned of their pupils, because it's an idea that can't be thought. It is, in that sense, a pseudo idea. It, it can't even be conceptualized. So let's go back even earlier. We're going to jump back uh, roughly a decade to this guy, Henry Bradshaw Fearon. This actually is not his likeness. I don't know of any pictures of him. So this is an AI generated image of what he might have looked like. I have no clue how accurate it may be or not. But in 1833, he wrote a book called Thoughts on Materialism. And the main heading inside the book is Materialism, a Scripture Doctrine. And he starts with a historical sketch of immaterialism. He argues that the idea of immateriality originated among pagans. And he describes some of that history. And then he explains that a chief doctrine of Jesus and his apostles was a future life to be obtained only by means of a resurrection of the body. This is a theme, by the way, that recurs throughout Christian materialist authors, that the resurrection of the body as the sole means of a future life is evidence that Jesus and his early followers were materialists. Because if they thought that the body was just the house of the soul, as it were, and that the soul is an immaterial bodiless or, you know, the thing that is not inherently bodily in its own right, then the death of the body would not be the end of existence. The soul would continue. But the fact that the early followers of Jesus and Jesus himself taught that the only means of having a future life is through bodily resurrection is evidence that they were materialists, at least in regard to human nature. So, after describing this, uh, he then says about the doctrine of the resurrection, it is a doctrine which secures the object of future existence without being encumbered with the palpable absurdities and philosophical puzzles of immaterialism. It comports with the most enlightened reason and the deepest 
philosophical and physiological research. And he goes on, but for sake of time, I won't read the whole quote. I'll have to skip uh, several things in this section. He also says in this book, I deem immaterialism under every form as alike unsupported by reason and opposed to revelation. The words of Jesus, so far from proving, tend to disprove immaterialism. Okay, so here's someone who's a believer in revelation. This is someone who uh, follows Jesus, believes that his teachings are true. He believes that God reveals messages to human humanity, and yet he is a materialist. And he sees, he's, he's not trying to reconcile materialism and, and kind of like find a compromise between materialism and Christianity. He believes that materialism is actually the teaching of Jesus and the early Christian church. Very, very interesting. And he wasn't the only one to say this. In fact, let's hop back another 10 years to this gentleman, Thomas Cooper. You may not have heard of him before, but he's actually a significant figure in American history. He was a scientific advisor to James Madison. He was a philosopher, chemist, geologist, lawyer, judge, politician, uh, college president. He was appointed by Thomas Jefferson to uh, have a position in the University of Virginia. Good friends with Thomas Jefferson. Anyway, so significant figure. And in 1823, he published a pamphlet called The Scripture Doctrine of Materialism. On page six, he says, I propose to show that the opinion denominated materialism is, and the opinion denominated immaterialism is not consistent with Christianity. So he's not only saying, hey, materialism and Christianity can go together. They're compatible. No, he's saying immaterialism is actually inconsistent. It's not consistent with Christianity. And he believes that materialism is. And indeed, he ends up arguing throughout his book that Jesus himself taught materialism. On page 23, he says, the doctrine of a future state stands on a much firmer basis on the supposition of the resurrection of the body and the body only than on the resurrection of the soul. If indeed this last be not, as I take it to be, a manifest contradiction in terms. The being whom it shall please God through Jesus Christ to raise from the dead, from the grave, will be the object of future rewards and punishments in another life for its deeds or misdeeds transacted in this life. I know of no materialist who denies this, and I believe it is a doctrine probable, but not certain, independent of scripture, from considerations connected with the moral government of the universe, but rendered certain by the Christian scriptures only. To an immaterialist, the scripture doctrine of the resurrection is superfluous, for his man is essentially immortal in his immortal soul. To a materialist, it is everything, for it contains the only sure and certain proof of a resurrection that is to be found within the compass of human knowledge. So here he's arguing that if you take the position of immaterialism, the Christian doctrine of the resurrection becomes superfluous it really doesn't have much value because you're immortal anyway. And why would you want to be cumbered with the flesh, cumbered with a, a body? But to a materialist who believes that the only existence is bodily existence, and that when someone dies, they are gone, and that the only way to come back is to be bodily remade, well then, the opportunity for the resurrection as promised in the gospel is valued so immensely. So he's really make the, making the point that immaterialism kind of um, takes the power out of Jesus' teachings, whereas materialism shows it in its true force. Now, this book, The Scripture Doctrine of Materialism, even though you've probably never heard of it, it was read by at least one person who you have heard of, and that is Thomas Jefferson. As I mentioned, 
Jefferson and Cooper were friends. And when Jefferson read this, he wrote Cooper a letter and said the following, that the doctrine of materialism was that of Jesus himself was a new idea to me, yet it is proved unquestionably. In other words, Jefferson was convinced by the case that Thomas Cooper made in his book that Jesus himself taught materialism. Now, it's interesting because as you look at Thomas Jefferson's earlier writings, it's apparent that he himself was already a materialist and already a Christian. He believed in Jesus and he was a materialist. So he was a Christian materialist, but he didn't know that Jesus himself taught materialism. He just thought that Jesus didn't teach immaterialism. So it was kind of an open question. Um, but, and I'll actually read one letter where he expresses his Christian materialism earlier. But again, Thomas Cooper's book is what convinced him that Jesus actually taught materialism. It is actually essential to Christianity being the teachings of Jesus himself. So this is what uh, Thomas Jefferson said to John Adams, actually. I have the date incorrect here. It should be um, 1820, if I'm not mistaken, and it should be to uh, John Adams. So he says, to talk of immaterial existence is to talk of nothings. To say the human soul, angels, God, are immaterial is to say they are nothings, or that there is no God, no angels, no soul. I cannot reason otherwise. But I believe I am supported in my creed of materialism by the Locks, the Tracys, the Stuarts. At what age of the Christian church this heresy of immaterialism, or masked atheism, crept in? I do not exactly know. But a heresy it certainly is. Jesus taught nothing of it. Okay, so he knew that Jesus didn't teach immaterialism and that it crept in later. He calls it a masked atheism because, again, if it's an immaterial God, what's the difference between an immaterial God and a no God? Immaterial soul and no soul. Immaterial angels, no angels, etc. Now, this is interesting. Sometimes people think that Thomas Jefferson was an atheist or a deist, uh, certainly not a believer in revelation, but here he's manifesting his Christian beliefs. And there are other uh, writings by Jefferson where he uh, expresses his Christian materialism. Again, immaterial existence is nothing, according to Thomas Jefferson. Okay, now I'm going to go back to another person who was actually a friend of both Thomas Cooper and Thomas Jefferson, and one who influenced them both. And that is Joseph Priestley. He's another one of these, one of these guys from this period that was just a polymath. He was a chemist, a philosopher, politician, historian, wrote on language, uh, English grammar, education, theology, a whole host of different things. He's probably best known for discovering oxygen, pretty big. And also he invented uh, carbonation. So anytime that you have a carbonated beverage, you can think of Joseph Priestley. In 1777, he wrote this book, Disquisitions Relating to Matter and Spirit, and it's all about materialism. He argues for materialism based on philosophical arguments, scientific arguments, and perhaps surprisingly, scripture. Now, there's a uh, you know how some authors are more or less quotable than others? Joseph Priestley is not as quotable. You have to read long sections to really get what he's getting at. So if you really want to get into this, just read the whole book. It's on uh, books.google.com. Uh, yeah, it's obviously in the public domain by now. So you can read the whole thing. But I'll give you a little sample here without reading the whole thing. But here he is in, this is in the book, Disquisitions. Disquisitions. Um, he's responding to a gentleman named Mr. Baxter in his essay on the soul. Baxter was an immaterialist and a Christian. And he's, Baxter is having to account for the resurrection of the body. Because, well, if humans are fundamentally souls, uh, immaterial souls in bodies that then escape the body, why would there be a resurrection of the body? 
And so he's having to argue that, well, you know, the the resurrection isn't necessarily bad because God can work a miracle in matter so that matter is not a hindrance to the body. And Joseph Priestley looks at this and he's like, hey, really, is this how the Christian hope of the resurrection is to be viewed? That it is barely no disadvantage? Is that really how we should regard the resurrection? And um, that's how it would be naturally regarded given immaterialism. But that kind of just shows the problem of immaterialism from a Christian perspective. So, yes, Priestley is kind of just, can this be that state towards which all Christians are taught to look? You know, he, he's just saying that there's really a, a problem here. Now, after dealing with the problems of immaterialism and uh, how immaterialism has a difficult time being reconciled with Jesus' teaching of the resurrection, he says, on the other hand, the system of materialism, which revelation uniformly supposes, is clogged with none of these difficulties or rather absurdities. Man, according to this system, is no more than we now see of him. By the help of the system of materialism also, the Christian removes the very foundation of many doctrines which have exceedingly debased and corrupted Christianity, being in fact a heterogeneous mixture of pagan notions diametrically opposed to those of which the whole system of revelation is built. So he sees immaterialism as opposed to divine revelation, and materialism to be uniformly supposed and promoted by divine revelation. So we will just consider one more uh, Christian materialist. We're actually going to jump back another hundred or so years to Thomas Hobbes. Now, Hobbes is an interesting character because he's remembered as a materialist, but he's not remembered as a Christian materialist. Here's just a sample of his expression of materialism. He was very, very clear in his uh, expression of materialistic philosophy. Whatsoever is real here or there or in any place has dimensions, that is to say, magnitude. That which hath magnitude, whether it be visible or invisible, finite or infinite, is called by all the learned a body. It followeth all real things, in that they are all somewhere, are corporeal. So he's saying everything, everything that actually exists is corporeal. So people read this and say, well, he must be an atheist. <laughs> That's uh, often today, still people think he was an atheist or a deist or something, but clearly not, not Christian, not religious in any way. This is largely just because people don't have the category of Christian materialist. And when they read someone expressing materialistic views, they have a hard time categorizing them within Christianity. They assume they must be an opposer of Christianity. They must be a non-believer. But Hobbes addressed that quite clearly himself. Consider this. Uh, uh, this is part of an answer to Bishop Bramhall. And he says... He's, again, responding to attacks against him, essentially. He said, I come now to his next period or paragraph, wherein he would fain prove that by denying incorporeal substance, I take away God's existence. The words he cites here are mine. Now, in italics, these are Hobbes' own words that Bramhall uh, cited from him. To say an angel or spirit is an incorporeal substance is to say, in effect, there is no angel or spirit at all. So that's the end of what Bram Hall cited from him. And Hobbes says, it is true also that to say that God is an incorporeal substance is to say, in effect, there is no God at all. What alleges he against it? But the school divinity, which I have already answered. Scripture, he can bring none because the word incorporeal is not found in Scripture. Very interesting. Later, in this same reply or answer to Bramhall, he says, 
he would make the world believe I were an atheist. But upon what ground? Because I say that God is a spirit, but corporeal. But to say that is allowed me by St. Paul that says, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, there is a spiritual body and there is an animal body. He that holds there is a God and that God is really somewhat for body is doubtless a real substance is as far from being an atheist as it is possible to be. So again, here's Hobbes. He's citing Paul, you know, who wrote 1 Corinthians in support of his perspective. And he is saying that, hey, to say that God is incorporeal is actually leaning toward atheism, not uh, saying that God is corporeal. So continuing on, he says, but he that says God is an incorporeal substance, no man can be sure whether he be an atheist or not. For no man living can tell whether there be any substance at all that is not also corporeal. For neither the word incorporeal nor immaterial nor any word equivalent to it is to be found in scripture or in reason. But on the contrary, that the Godhead dwelleth bodily in Christ is found in Colossians 2, 9. And Tertullian maintains that God is either a corporeal substance or nothing, nor was he ever condemned for it by the church. So Tertullian was a church father of the second and third uh, century, and he asserted the corporeality of God as well. So notice how Hobbes is really arguing like, hey, look, for me to be denying incorporeality and to affirm the corporeality of all things, even God, is as far from atheism as it's possible to be. He's like saying this is firmly rooted in Christianity. Now, uh, this is an interesting text, Considerations Upon the Reputation, Loyalty, Manners, and that should say religion of Thomas Hobbes. Uh, this is actually a text written by Hobbes, evidently, but written in third person. So uh, he says some very interesting things here about corporealism, materialism, immateriality, etc. What kind of attribute, I pray you, is immaterial or incorporeal substance? Where do you find it in the scripture? Whence came it hither but from Plato and Aristotle, heathens? And would you learn Christianity from Plato and Aristotle? But seeing there is no such word in the scriptures, how will you warrant it from natural reason? Neither Plato nor Aristotle did ever write of or mention an incorporeal spirit. For they could not conceive how a spirit, which in their language was pneuma, in ours a wind, could be incorporeal. So notice he's saying that incorporeality, the, the notion of incorporeality, does not come to us from scripture. It comes from Plato and Aristotle. But then he points out that they never speak of incorporeal spirit, incorporeal pneuma, because that word to them is like wind, right? That's something corporeal, not something incorporeal. So in other words, even the incorporealists of ancient times did not regard spirit to be incorporeal. So Hobbes is defending his own perspective that God is a spirit, but God is corporeal. What does spirit mean? Well, again, that's something that we can cover more later. So uh, one more thing from Hobbes here. He says, and again, this is him speaking about himself in third person. There has hitherto appeared in Mr. Hobbes, his doctrine, no sign of atheism. And whatsoever can be inferred from the denying from the denying of incorporeal substances makes Tertullian, one of the ancientest of the fathers, and most of the doctors of the Greek church, as much atheists as he. For Tertullian, in his treatise De Carne Christi, says plainly, and I'll skip the Latin, that is to say, now this is the translation of the Latin, whatsoever is anything is a body of its kind. Nothing is incorporeal, but that which has no being. So this is uh, Hobbes really, he's quoting Tertullian. 
in support of materialism or corporealism. And uh, we're going to just have a little bit more here that we're going to go through. Uh, but I want to point out a couple things to just take away from Hobbes. Hobbes is, he's been saying that incorporeal, the word incorporeal, isn't found in scripture. Spirits can be corporeal. Anciently, spirits were not considered incorporeal. And he also even points out that Plato didn't use the word spirit to mean incorporeal. And he's rooting his, um, you know, his materialism in ancient Christianity, pointing back to early church fathers and to scripture itself. So we're going to use Hobbes here as our springboard into the ancient world. And throughout the rest of our series, we're going to really talk about these ancient texts. But I'll, before we really dive into that, I want to look at one more person. This is in the ancient world now. This is a, a slightly later contemporary of Tertullian, Origen. Now, Origen was a third century church father, and he was an incorporealist, not a materialist, not a corporealist. He believed in immateriality. And he was a Platonist. That is, philosophically, he was a follower of Plato. Now, he says a few interesting things that indicate uh, that materialism is not so foreign a thing to Christianity, even at this very early time. There were indeed materialistic views, and it's interesting to kind of get a glimpse of that in the writings of one who is clearly not a materialist. So he says the term asomaton, i.e. incorporeal, is disused and unknown, not only in many other writings, but also in our own scriptures. So notice this is actually what Hobbes was saying, that in the scriptures, the word incorporeal does not appear. Well, here's Origen, who would love to have it in scripture because he's an incorporealist, and he's saying the same thing. This word does not appear. We shall inquire, however, whether the thing which Greek philosophers call a somaton or incorporeal is found in Holy Scripture under another name. So he's thinking, hey, look, yes, it's, the word isn't there, but maybe the idea is. And that's a, a fair enough point uh, in its own right. But then he says, for it is also to be a subject of investigation how God himself is to be understood, whether it has corporeal and formed according to some shape or of a different nature from bodies, a point which is not clearly indicated in our teaching. And the same inquiries have to be made regarding Christ and the Holy Spirit, as well as respecting every soul and everything possessed of a rational nature. So this is quite interesting because here he's talking about the whether God and souls and Christ and the Holy Spirit and everything of a rational nature is corporeal or incorporeal. Now, he argues that it is incorporeal. All these things are incorporeal. And yet he's saying that it's not something that's clear among us, that is, among Christians. In other words, incorporealism was not universally held. And, of course, we just read a quote from uh, Tertullian that Hobbes made, where Hobbes said that everything is corporeal. So we know that there were, indeed, at this time, Christian corporealists. Uh, in another writing now, Origen makes a very interesting statement. He says, The Jews indeed, but also some of our people, that is Christians, supposed that God should be understood as a man, that is, adorned with human members and human appearances. But the philosophers despise these stories as fabulous and formed in the likeness of poetic fictions. If they say you give him the experience of speaking, you will doubtless give him also a mouth and a tongue and other members with which the function of speaking is performed. But if this be so, one has departed from the invisible and incorporeal God, and they harass our people, joining many similar arguments to these. So here's Origen. He's a Christian, and he's an incorporealist. Remember, he's a Platonist philosopher. And here he's saying that Jews believe that God is corporeal and has a, a body shaped like a man, and that some of our own people, that is Christians, believe that too. And the philosophers, these are non-Christian philosophers, 
are basically ridiculing the Christians for believing this about God, that he is this corporeal being and not an invisible incorporeal God. And so Origen now is in kind of a tough place where he's having to defend Christianity and make it look better to the non-Christians. This is kind of interesting because sometimes uh, you get the impression from various Christian apologists today that, oh, ancient pagan religions, they had anthropomorphic corporeal gods, but Christianity had this immaterial god that totally transcends time and space. Well, here, Origen, the early Christian incorporealist, is trying to defend the Christian faith, uh, you know, to make it look good to those who are incorporealists outside of Christianity and who are making fun of Christian corporealists. So yeah, very, very uh, interesting circumstance. One more quote from Origen. This is another text. This is his commentary on John 4.24, which is the famous verse that says, God is spirit. He says, in this passage, it is stated as if his essence were spirit, for it says God is spirit. If then we should listen to these words literally, making no inquiry beyond the letter, we would have to say that God is a body. Hmm, just pause there for a moment. It's very uh, interesting how, you know, this text is often viewed today as you know, like a proof text for the incorporeality of God, that God is immaterial, God is spirit. But as we just read from Hobbes earlier, the word spirit was not anciently used to refer to something incorporeal. Spirit was understood to be matter. And so Origen, even though he believes that God is incorporeal, is actually not viewing this uh, statement, God is spirit in John 4.24, as something that defends his own view. He's having to say, okay, yes, if we take it literally, it means that God is a body, but we shouldn't take it literally. And that's what he says in what follows. He says, just as when we find it written that God has eyes, eyelids, ears, hands, arms, feet, and even wings, we change what is written into an allegory, despising those who bestow on God a form resembling men. And we do this with good reason. So also must we act consistently with our practice in the case of the names mentioned above, including the word spirit. So again, spirit at this time in the third century was not used to mean something incorporeal. This is before spirit was spiritualistic. And again, notice that Origen, while he was an incorporealist, his views certainly were not accepted by all of his contemporary Christians. So we have good reason to see that, wow, Christian corporealism has been around for hundreds of years from our perspective today, and it even goes back into ancient Christianity. And you may remember uh, in a previous quote here from Origen, he mentioned that the Jews believe that God is corporeal. Well, we know that the earliest followers of Jesus were Jews. So it makes one wonder, well, did they have the perspective of other Jews and a perspective that evidently lasted later into Christianity, that God is corporeal and presumably other things are corporeal? So let's summarize our main points here. First, we covered key terms like materialism and its equivalents and immaterialism and its equivalents. And hopefully now you have a much clearer understanding of what materialism is and what immaterialism is. We also considered certain core beliefs to both immaterialism and materialism. These different subjects, thinking that is human thought, death, and God. And on these three subjects, we can get a very clear grasp as to whether the author whose writings we're considering was a materialist or an immaterialist. And lastly, we looked at history, Christian materialism. Remember, Christian materialism is a thing, and it's been around for a long time. So, this was just the beginning. We have much more to come. These are the future talks of our series. The next one will be 
material minds and mortality, human nature and death in ancient Israel. Uh, there's a whole lot to cover. I'm sure you will all find it fascinating, especially if you found this talk fascinating, which I'm assuming that you found it interesting given that you're here at the end. Um, but please check out our future talks as well. And again, consider it with keeping in mind all these principles of learning and investigation that we talked about earlier. Thank you so much. Farewell.